I've been receiving a lot of requests to conduct the same tests for video shooting that I did on the Fujifilm X-H2S, but on the newer X-H2. And so I did that, and today I'm gonna share those results with you. Let's get undone. Gerald Dunn. he's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Dunn, and I feel a lot more like I do now than I did a while ago. So Fuji was kind enough to relend me the X-H2S along with the new X-H2 and a couple of lenses, so that I could compare the technical details that we covered in the previous video. I highly encourage you to watch that video if you haven't already, as we will not be retreading over any of the redundancies, and there are a lot of them, as these two cameras are identical in most ways. As usual, Fuji didn't sponsor this video, no money changed hands, and they don't get any input on this video's production or get you preview before it's posted. This video does have a sponsor though, and that's Nebula and their partner, CuriosityStream. So the main differences between these two cameras is the sensor and the price. The X-H2S is $2,500 US dollars for a 26 megapixel stacked APS-C sensor, where the X-H2 is cheaper at $2,000 US dollars for a higher resolution 40 megapixel sensor, but it's not stacked and thus is slower. For video, this means you can record 8K on the X-H2 instead of just the 6K on the X-H2S, but the rolling shutter is worse and you no longer have 4K 120. And even the 4K 60 has some drawbacks, which we'll get into shortly. You can also record 6K on the X-H2, which is oversampled from the 8K, but it's 16 by nine and there are no open gate modes on this camera, unlike the 6.2K 3x2 capture of the X-H2S. These different sensors may produce different autofocus results as well. I had a hard time telling the difference, but I believe the X-H2 is supposed to be slightly worse. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Fuji's autofocus for video and found them both to be somewhat lacking, but similar. But just for clarity, allow me to reiterate that the rest of the hardware is the same. Same screen, same EVF, same battery, same ports, same layout, buttons, dials, and same compatibility with accessories like the battery grip and fan attachment. And in the menu, you have almost entirely the same experience, including my complaint about the overcomplicated codec and recording mode options, the notable difference being the maximum resolution and frame rate with the X-H2, allowing up to 8K at 30 frames per second. There's also this clever digital zoom, which when you're in the oversampled mode, the 4K HQ, it allows you to zoom in up to 2X by basically reducing this, the amount of resolution that you're oversampling from. So instead of 8K, as you go down to 2X, it's just 4K one to one, but you could do a 1.5 and zoom in a little bit further, but oversample from a lower overall resolution. It's a clever implementation and it works well. However, the oversampling does have a limitation in that it doesn't apply to the 4K 60. And the 4K 60 on this camera also has a crop which the X-H2S doesn't. And I believe the 4K60 oversamples on this camera. So the four, there's a big difference in the 4K60 between the two cameras. On this one, you're getting a cropped, non-oversampled 4K60. And there's sort of a issue with the non-oversampled 4K on this camera that I'm gonna show you some comparison examples of when we get into the dynamic range and noise. Actually, why don't we jump into that right now and I'm gonna start recording my screen and share with you my results. All right, so as you can see along here, I did a ton of dynamic range tests using the Xyla 21, similar to what I did with the X-H2S, just because there's so many combinations of codecs and resolution options, and I wanted to see what the sweet spot was, and I have that for you. These are the results generated from Imatest, and a quick little refresher, if you don't remember, the slope-based DR number up here, that's sort of the total number of stops that the camera can see. This is usually when a manufacturer advertises, our camera can do 14 stops or 15 stops. They're referring to this number here. And then we also like to look at the 0.5 medium score here. This is with a signal to noise ratio of two. So this is how many stops are clean and usable versus just how many exist. And so, for instance, this first result here is with the X-H2, this is 4K HQ, and the HQ thing is important. That's the oversampled one, because we're gonna talk a lot about that. And this is F-Log2 and ISO 1000. There's a different base ISO on this camera than there was on the X-H2S. And so we're seeing 15 stops total pretty much, and we're getting 11.7 .7 clean stops. And if we compare that to the X-H2S in F-Log2, again, the base ISO is 1250, it's a little bit higher. Uh, we're also, we're seeing 14.6 and getting 11.9. So they're within the margin of error of being pretty similar to where I wouldn't feel confident saying one is definitely better. And in fact, in a lot of my tests, I had difficulty seeing one do significantly better than the other when comparing HQ to the X-H2S, not when you turn off oversampling. Now we also have F-Log1 for the X-H2, which is fewer stops total, 13.6, 
but 12 points too. Now keep in mind, these scores are all with noise reduction turned off as best I could in camera. So that's turning it down to minus four and turning off the other option on both cameras when doing the comparison. Shooting in 8K and putting it in a 4K timeline, we get again 14.9 and we get 11.4. So the difference here is if you let the camera oversample and you shoot it in H265, you get a slightly better result than if you do the oversampling yourself in an NLE by just dropping it in a timeline and allowing it to downsample. You could again finesse the AK image to get you a better result, but if you just do no work, there's there's similar with like a third of a stop, but slightly better let the camera do it because H265 seems to handle noise better than ProRes and H64. So, and then here we have the 8K ProRes HQ on an 8K timeline. This is this is the worst result you're going to get in the sense that nothing is being done to the image. It's 8K ProRes HQ straight into the camera, dropped in an 8K timeline and measured in its 8K size and it's 10.8. But again, so 10.8 clean of 14.9, but this image is about as pure as you're going to get out of this camera. So you could noise reduce this in post and produce probably the best result of all if you wanted to because no oversampling has been done yet, nothing. So you could drop this in a 4K timeline, add some noise reduction, and you're going to get 13, 14 clean stops if you want because the Fuji sensors I find cleans up really well because the noise is, noise is quite nice. And I have a little example of noise reduction but without even using the 8K image. So this is 4K HQ, F-Log2, ProRes HQ, out of the camera, too many HQs. And so we get 11.6 stops and it can see a total of 15.1. So this is what I was talking about. The ProRes, you get a slight reduction, like a 10% reduction when you shoot ProRes instead of H.265. But then if we noise reduce this in DaVinci Resolve, I just, I whenever I do these tests, I just do a, a tiny bit of noise reduction just to see how it cleans up. It jumped up to 13.6 with a 14.6 of the 1.0 low score and you could push this a little bit further, you could do some chroma work, and you're gonna get really, really good noise reduction results. I, I talked about this a lot in my X-H2S review. Anyway, that's just to show you, you get two stops from just adding a little bit of noise reduction in post. So that's impressive. And then lastly, let's talk about the non-oversampled one. This is the X-H2 Just 4K. Now it's interesting, you'll notice that it still gets 11.7 .7 clean stops, but look what happened to the total stop scene. Here, I'll switch back to the 4K HQ. So 14.9 stops, it can see 11.7 .7 clean. When non-oversampled, 12.6 stops total, 11.7 .7 clean. And look at the low number. It's exactly the same as the total dynamic range. Where over here, there's a disparity, as there should be. So this is strange because I've never seen a camera do this before. But what's happening, as far as I can tell, is that when you turn off oversampling, so you're just shooting sort of a line-skipped 4K, it's also cutting off anything at the noise floor and just crushing it to black. So fundamentally, it, it means that there's a massive dynamic range potential difference between the two because there's no way you can clean up the non-oversampled mode. 12.6 is the max. No matter how much noise reduction you apply, it can't turn black into an image. And here's what it looks like in an actual clip. So this is the oversampled mode and note the tonality, I guess, of the shadow over here as well as the dark chips. And then when I switch to the non-oversampled, see how it gets darker? And the black here becomes very black. Let me switch back. This is almost like a dark gray, and now it's black. And here's what we see with the Xyla 21. Look how many stops into the shadows we can see. And then if we turn off oversampling, see how it just cuts a bunch of them away? And these ones get a lot more harsh. This is the exact, every setting is the same in the camera. I'm just changing HQ on and off. That's all I've been changing. I don't know why it's doing that, but it's doing that and I confirmed it. Uh, there was a, I reached out on Twitter and thankfully a user, I don't have Twitter on this computer so I can't pull up his name, but I'll put it in edit. I'll put it on the screen here now. Thank you for helping me out. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't just my camera doing this, but sure enough, this user, actually I think I have his clips here. He sent me two clips. So you can see this one has a certain sort of level of shadows to them around Hitchcock's head you just lose information, it goes into black. So it's not just my camera, it's other cameras as well. I shared these results with Fuji and reached out to them to see if they had any information and I, and I don't have any answers back yet. So if I do get something, you know, in the, in the near future, I'll pin a comment, you know, if there's an answer or maybe there's firmware coming or maybe it's meant to do that and here's a reason why. I'll put whatever I get and I'll pin a comment. Now, because the base ISOs aren't the same on these two cameras, the second native ISO isn't the same either. Now, just like I said with the X-H2S, this one is 
kind of speculative because it's really hard to see. But if you do move your way up the ISO range, you do see it clean up uh, at a certain point. On the X-H2S in F-Log2, I believe it was ISO 3200, you see it clean up. On the X-H2, it seems to do the same thing, but at ISO 2000, so lower. It's like base is 1000, cleans up at 2000. This one was 1250, cleans up at 3200. Not even the same spread, but that's the best I could see. Again, it's very, very subtle though. And then as far as noise performance overall, I would say they're very similar. There might be slightly more noise on the X-H2, but it's very hard to tell. And like I said, they both clean up extremely well, just like we saw with the X-H2S. Now there are some rolling shutter differences, as you might expect when comparing a stack sensor to a non-stacked, especially when the non-stacked is even higher resolution. But the X-H2S had a stellar readout speed of, I think, 1 180th of a second. Now the number I got from Fuji for the X-H2 is 1 88th of a second, which actually is a pretty good result. But I'm not sure to which mode this applies because there's obviously a difference between the regular 4K and the oversampled 4K. I'm thinking that the 1 88th might be the, the bad 4K, the crushed blacks 4K, the non-oversampled 4K, because that mode reminded me more of like an A7S III speed, which would be similar, I think the A7 is like 1 100th of a second, so similar, where when you put it in oversampled mode, while still not terrible uh, for rolling shutter for an 8K oversampled readout, it is jelloier than the A7S III and similar cameras. So I think the 188th, if I'm not mistaken, applies to the non-oversampled mode and you're gonna get a slower result on the oversampled 4K. But that's up to you whether that's too much or not. It is noticeable when compared to the X-H2S. I compared the color and white balance between the two cameras and I noticed that they were almost exactly the same. When it comes to white balance proficiency, they're both really, really good. Uh, as you can see here, I'm getting a 130, 130, 129. So the RGB channels are almost perfectly balanced on the X-H2S, I believe that one is. And then on the X-H2, 129, 129. So again, very, very, very similar and both pretty much perfect. However, if you look at the vector scope down here, the X-H2S and then the X-H2, when shooting in Eterna, and I believe other film emulations as well, the X-H2 seems to be slightly more saturated, just a little bit, but it's there. However, if you shoot in log, if you look at the points down here, as I switch back and forth, this is just using the manufacturer LUT for log. They both fall in very similar places. You're not gonna have any issue mixing the footage, but there are different LUTs for each camera and the LUTs are all available on Fuji's website. So you have F-Log one and two LUTs for both the X-H2S and the X-H2. Okay, now here I wanted to talk about the resolution detail. And what's fun about it is we can actually see a little bit of what's going on in the non oversampled mode. So let me show you an image of what the, this is the 4K HQ mode. So if we zoom in real, real tight here, we can see how the pixels are being resolved on a 4K timeline. And if I switch to the 8K image, we can see they're very similar. There's a slight shift. And then here's the XH2S, which has a slightly different pattern for how it handles the pixels and the oversampling, but still very, very, very good maybe slightly worse around these high contrast edges here if we compare it to the 8K and 8K oversampled versions of the X-H2. But keep in mind, we're at like 360% here. If you pull it a little bit and you kind of look at sort of general details I flip through, you're not really gonna, I'm not trying to say 8K doesn't mean anything, but I've always said that once you hit like 6K oversampling, anything beyond that is pretty hard to tell unless you're reframing at 200%, and even then, basically don't worry about resolution and detail on either of these cameras. You're gonna be perfectly set with either of them, unless we're talking about the non-oversampled mode, which also applies to the 4K60. So that stuff I showed you about how it getting darker, that's gonna happen on the 4K60 on this camera because there's no 4K60 HQ mode. So in that case, this really pulls ahead. And also let's look at what it's actually doing in this non-oversampled mode. So there's a huge difference here. Look between this image, which is oversampled, and this one. And so what's interesting is you see how we're seeing these long, like vertical bars of like combined kind of pixels. So this mode, the non oversampled, the non HQ mode, it's reading from the same horizontal resolution of like an 8K horizontal resolution, but it's vertical resolution, the amount of lines that it has is not an 8K amount of lines being sampled from it's only sampling from a 4K amount of lines. So it's actually slightly more than 4K. So imagine you're getting a one-to-one -one amount of lines, but a two-to-one 
horizontal resolution. So it's it's kind of like line skipping in the sense that we're skipping a certain amount or maybe they're combining them beforehand. I don't really know the process. You never find that out from the manufacturers too much. But it's doing something to the vertical resolution and then leaving the horizontal resolution intact. And so you end up with these kind of streaks, these vertical streaks, which is, it's interesting anyway. This is just, this is just for fun. But it's fun how when you have high contrast stuff like this red to blue, this is a chroma subsampling chart. You can really see it kind of like the weird patterns that it does compared to non modes. But when we zoom out, you know, it's not too terrible, which is why I generally don't worry too much about, you know, a good, a good binning algorithm versus oversampling when it comes to, you know, wide shots full of detail because they're both going to look good. The main issue with the non HQ mode isn't this, you know, limited vertical resolution. It's the weird crushing the blacks thing. That's what actually kills it for me. But I just thought you would find that interesting. As far as oversampled on either camera, they both look great, but 4K60 is definitely better over here because of vertical resolution, because of crop, and because of weird crushed blacks. It's also worth noting that that issue doesn't occur if you shoot in just 6K or 8K. Then you get, again, full shadow detail. You don't get any black cutoff at, you know, 12 stops or whatever. You still get to see the whole image in 6K and 8K which is why I know that it's sort of being, not created by the way that it's being subsampled, but rather happening at the same time. Because I've never seen anybody else that uses any kind of binning or skipping create that weird crushed black effect. But whatever's going on at that time in the pipeline is when other thing's going on. Because if you shoot 6K or 8K, you're fine as well. So that's no big deal. So my advice is to shoot in 4K HQ on this camera. Of course, that means you can't shoot in 4K 60, so if you need to shoot in 4K60, that's a whole nother, I mean, we'll talk about that when we talk about value. But basically I'm saying shoot in 4K HQ mode and then F-Log1 or F-Log2 is kind of up to you. You get more potential headroom in F-Log2, but you'll have a slightly cleaner image rate at a camera with F-Log1. Now, when it comes to shooting in 4K HQ, I obviously did some battery rundown and overheating tests to make sure that it's usable in the 4K HQ, and it is. I was able to record two hours and three minutes in 4K HQ, I think it was 4K24 in a climate controlled environment. And heat was not an issue that died because of the battery. Uh, and the camera, it got a little bit warm, but nothing to be too worried about. Comparatively, if you shoot in 4K non-HQ mode, I got two hours and 37 minutes. So I actually got an extra half hour and the camera was still like room temperature. It didn't, it didn't even warm up at all. So you are creating more heat and chewing through the battery faster with HQ, but you can still get a good two hours out of the camera battery wise in the HQ mode, so I'm sticking with shoot 4K HQ. And then I also did the rundown test in 8K and I got one hour and 49 minutes. And at that point, the camera's pretty hot to the touch. So there's a smaller difference between 4K HQ and 8K because they're both sampling from 8K, but recording the 8K cooked the camera up pretty good. So hopefully that information is useful in helping you decide which camera is right for your needs. I'd say the easiest way to look at it is that if the camera is gonna be used on a static tripod and shooting at 30p or lower, you might as well save the $500 and get the X-H2. The only time you're gonna see an advantage in spending the extra money for the X-H2S is if you're shooting a lot of 4K 60 or 4K 120, or doing a lot of panning or run and gun style filming. It's in those applications that the faster reading S camera will show its strengths. That being said, you can still shoot 4K 60 on the X-H2 in a pinch. It's just less convenient with the crop and a worse image than what the X-H2S can produce at that frame rate. But if I had to buy one for in here for talking head style YouTube videos and locked off product shots, I'd get the X-H2 and save the $500. Overall, I think both of these cameras are solid options for Fuji shooters. And I like that they're both available at different prices depending on your needs. And while we're on the topic of value, I'd like to tell you about the awesome deal going on with the sponsor of today's video, Nebula, and their partner, CuriosityStream. So Nebula is a platform that gives YouTubers like myself a place where we can host our content ad-free without fear of YouTube restriction or demonetization. It's mostly educational or education adjacent content. And I've recently been migrating my catalog over there and have a bunch of videos uploaded already. I really love the platform, and highly recommend it. Watching your favorite creators on Nebula supports us directly, financially, and allows you to watch the content you enjoy without the ads of YouTube or the sponsor reads. They have a ton of great channels on the platform like Real Life Lore, Minute Physics, Cinema Wins, and Legal Eagle to name a few but the most cost-effective way to get Nebula isn't to subscribe to it directly, but instead by signing up for our partner service, CuriosityStream, which also happens to be the best streaming service on the internet when it comes to documentaries and educational content. Because when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get Nebula for free. And if you use the promo code UNDONE by going to curiositystream.com undone, or by just clicking the link in the description, you'll save an additional 26% and get both CuriosityStream and Nebula 
for just $14.79 for the whole year. And that bundle deal is not a trial. You'll keep Nebula for free for as long as you maintain your Curiosity Stream subscription. So even if you're only going to use one of the services, it's cheaper to get both. And I'm certain that you'll find plenty of content to enjoy and learn from on both platforms. And how can you go wrong for just $15 yearly? Thanks for listening. Yeah, all right. I'm done. <laughs>